Let's open up your Bibles this morning after that uh, movie trailer, as this morning we're actually going to talk a little bit about um, sex, and so I hope everybody in this room has knows what that is and has heard about it. Again, if you feel uncomfortable with that topic, um, feel free to excuse yourself or the kids, but the truth is we don't address it very often in church, and I think we're setting ourselves up for failure to train wreck our lives when we don't address this very, very important topic. Has anybody seen the movie Trainwreck yet? If you want to admit to it. Okay. All right. Some of us have. All right. So you know what I'm talking about. Open up your Bibles. If you need a Bible this morning, uh, raise your hand. Dwayne will bring them around. We want to make sure every single person has a Bible. Dwayne, right up here. And open up your sermon outlines and get those out this morning. And then hold your pens up in the air because it's very important that you write some of these notes down that we're going to be addressing this morning and open up your Bibles to Genesis 2. Genesis 2. Very first part of your Bible. Everybody there? Say amen if you're there. Genesis 2. All right. In this movie, since Amy was a little girl, she has been hearing from her father that monogamy isn't realistic. And so Amy grows up and, and lives the, the crazy lifestyle not ever committing, not believing that commitment is possible, moving from one relationship to another. And she becomes a magazine writer, and Amy lives by this enjoying life, feels that uh, commitment isn't actuality, she, but she's kind of in a rut. And when she meets this doctor, because she has to do an interview for the magazine, and she actually begins to like him, and they begin to date. She's wrestling with herself whether she needs to move on from the relationship because she doesn't believe in commitment. Or is she actually missing something? Is she actually missing something in her life? Is, is all the people that live this type of lifestyle actually missing out on something? And I think they are. Say missing something. Missing something. In Genesis 2, we see that Adam felt that he was missing something as well. In Genesis 2, when Adam looked at all of creation, here's what it says. It says, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And a lot of people use this verse, save my spot there, a lot of people use this verse as a verse to talk about marriage, trying to push people into marriage, saying that we need to marry, and I don't think this verse is saying that, and I'll show you that at the end, so please stick with me for the entire sermon, because I'm going to show you what that alone word, I think, really actually means. It's not saying that everybody needs to get married. It's not saying that just go out and get married, but there is something about Adam realized that he was alone. He was missing something. The world today says that we're missing something. In fact, the rate of divorce for marriage has obviously increased over time. In fact, in the recent years, they're saying that it de decreased, but the reason for this is that people... The marriage rate is decreasing, but so are the people who are actually choosing to get married. People now just live together. They feel that, uh, that it's okay just to be in the same house, to be in a relationship, but they don't want to get married. There's, there's a lack of commitment somewhere in their part because they feel like there's, there's something missing. See, culture tells us that this is okay. So 
living together is on the rise, divorce is on the decrease, but really it's not because people are just breaking up today and moving on from relationship to relationship, but they're not getting married, so they're really not getting divorced, okay? So it hasn't changed. In fact, the rate of divorce for years has been between 40 to 50 percent, and couples who attend church, and this is something that society or culture won't tell you, couples who actually attend church are twice as likely not to divorce. Culture won't tell you that. They'll tell you that Christians are divorcing at the same rate, and that's true inside the church they are, but couples who actually attend church have twice as much likely to actually stay together. So I got this for you. The couple that prays together stays together, right? Amen. Culture won't tell you that because culture tells you there's something missing. There's something missing. Culture's pushing an envelope for sex upon us and teaching us and showing us and instructing us how to live in relationships. But I got to say, if it's so good, then why is the divorce rate? Why has it been at 40, 50%? Why are people jumping around from relationship to relationship? Why are people constantly looking for something more because they still feel alone? There's something missing. And so what I want to do is I want to paint for you this morning. On Genesis 2, God's design for marriage. Because I care about you enough, even with as uncomfortable as it is, to actually elevate. And I want to show you, and this is my goal for this sermon, to really raise up the gift and the blessing of marriage. I want to raise up God's design for marriage because culture's not teaching that. The world's not teaching that. Your friends outside the church aren't going to tell you this. And so the Bible is the only thing that will instruct us on God's design for marriage. And God has a specific design. Doesn't it make sense that the creator of it is the one that should actually instruct us on how to actually live it out? And so I'm going to raise it up and then I'm going to actually address some of the downfalls because I want to address some singleness in here. All right. This isn't just for the married couples. This is everyone, how we're designed to be in relationship and how we're to live that out. And so I'll address that this morning as well. So let's get started with Genesis 2, 20 through 25. And it says that a man, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. God's design for marriage, this is the first marriage he brings Adam and Eve together and unites them as one flesh. In fact, the New Living Translation, I got a few different ones up here. It says, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united as one. The English Standard Version says, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. I want you to think about this. Yesterday... I was at C.B. Smith Park. It was actually Friday. I was at C.B. Smith Park with my kids and my wife, and and we're in this lazy river together, and and, uh, I'm holding on to my wife's inner tube, and we're together. I'm holding fast, and our son, our youngest one, five years old, Caleb, starts to float away, and she says, you need to go after him, and I'm I'm going, okay, I'm trying to drag her along, and I can't get her there quick enough, and so I'm going, I have to let go of you in order to pursue him. I can't hold on to both of you. I got to let go of one in order to go after the other. I think that's what actually the King James Bible says. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. I'm talking about leaving and cleaving this morning. Say leaving and cleaving. Leaving and cleaving. The Bible says that we need to leave. The first responsibility is to establish independence from your parents. Means you can't continue to be instructed by your parents if you're going to cleave to your wife. You can't continue to hold on to your parents and have a stronger relationship with them because you need to leave that in order to cleave with your wife. When I first got married, I remember how very difficult this was because my wife and I got married at a very young age. I was 19 years old. I was 19 years old. 
and we just got married, and she was just out of high school, and her family continued to talk to her whenever we would have a problem, and I would be like, wait a minute, I want you to come to me when there's a problem, and it was like the family was always involved. Do you ever feel like that? Yeah, yeah, I know you do. And then years later, she came to me and said, you know what? Every single time we have a problem, it seems like you talk to your mom on the phone, but when you come home, you just grunt at me. Because guys don't have this verbal language often, you know? We can communicate so many words with grunts and signals and, and things. And I had gotten so used to this pattern of just grunting around her, and yet when I was on the phone with my mom, I was actually revealing some of my inner heart. And she's like, you know what? I feel like you're not sharing with me as much as you are with your mom. And, and this idea of leaving and cleaving, we need to leave. Our first responsibility is to leave and we need to let go in order to cleave, in order to grab a hold. So cleave is the second responsibility is to establish commitment to one another, to establish commitment to one another. Cleave can refer to being in close contact, to staying really, really close to someone or something. So if you're walking around in, in pitch black, you get close to the person that has a flashlight. You're scared, you're nervous, and you, you go close to them. You're cleaving to them. That's what the instructor in Genesis is actually writing about, to leave one behind, to cleave to the other. And Adam comes and sees Eve for the very first time. And here are the words that he actually says to her. In Genesis 2.23, the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Now, bone is a symbol for strength. Flesh is a symbol for weakness. And so ultimately what Adam is saying when God presents Eve to him is, she will be strong where I am weak. And where she is weak, I will be strong. This idea of strength and weakness. They are better off together. They're, they're complete one another. Where she is weak, I will be strong. It sounds a little bit like a covenant. I want to talk to you about covenants and contracts. Say covenants and contracts. Covenants and contracts. A contract is an agreement of services that are to be rendered to me for an agreed upon amount of money. And so a contract is to make sure I receive the services that I'm paying for. It's, it's for me to actually receive something. A, a covenant is quite different. It's actually a promise that I enter into where I'm giving my word that I will give you what I am promising. Do you see the difference? A contract is to receive. A covenant is actually to give. I give a promise and I'm going to fulfill that promise. That's a covenant. A contract, you need to render services to me. So got three little things. A covenant is based on trust between parties. A covenant is based on trust. I'm going to give you my promise, and I'm going to fulfill my promise. That's a covenant. A contract is based on distrust. Because I don't believe you might fulfill your end of the bargain, I'm going to sign this contract to make it clear what you're going to do for me. That's a contract. A covenant is based on unlimited responsibility. I'm going to continue to honor my covenant. And no matter whether you honor yours or not, I'm going to honor mine. That's a covenant. A contract is based on limited liability. As long as you're entering your part of the agreement, then I will continue to fulfill my part of the agreement. Number three, a covenant cannot be broken if new circumstances occur. A contract can be voided by mutual consent. So in order to make sure my pool cleaner services my pool, and I don't really have a pool, this is just an example, we write a contract agreeing to a service that will be rendered. He will provide for my pool upon an amount of money that we agree that I will pay. If he does not provide the service, I fire him. If I don't pay the amount of money, he sues me. It's, it's a contract. A contract is to receive. You're receiving services or you're receiving amounts of money. A covenant is to give. A contract 
is for me to get something out of it. A covenant is for me to give something into it. Do you see the difference there? Covenants and contracts. Marriages were never meant to be contracts. Marriages from the beginning of time were designed to be covenants. Think about the vows that we say. Think about the, the agreements that we enter into. The traditional marriage vow says to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part according to God's holy ordinance. Now, it doesn't say, I'll love you when we're rich, but when we're poor, I'm out the door. It doesn't say, I'll love you when things are going well, but once things start to go bad and we have some troubled times, I'm leaving. It does not say that I'm entering into a contract where if you get sick, goodbye, so long, adios, I'm finding out somebody else who can fulfill my needs. That's not what the marriage vows that we enter into usually say. They're covenants. They're meant to be long-lasting till death do us part. But so often we treat marriages or the world tells us to treat marriages like contracts. If someone's not fulfilling your needs, find somebody else. If someone's not loving you, and then in our marriages, we have these type of thoughts. I will love her if she. I will sleep with him if he. Right? We're going to get real this morning. I will take her out if she. And we have all these different thoughts that if they fulfill my needs. And so when I do marriage counseling, and, and I do a lot of marriage counseling, especially here in South Florida, I do. And I'm not a certified marriage counselor, but I have become certified as a facilitator for a program called Prepare and Enrich. Prepare for future marriages. It's premarital counseling. Enrich for people who are already married who near marriage counseling. And so I sit before people and I actually instruct them over 10 different categories on marriage that normally end in divorce around these categories of finances, problem solving, conflict management, stress, anxiety, how to deal with all these different things that usually come up, parenting. Sex, yes, sex is a problem sometimes in relationships, and we're going to deal with that this morning. And so I usually instruct these people and facilitate these marriages because I want to spiritually guide them what bi the Bible teaches about relationships and marriage and about living together in covenant. And one of the first things I tell people, couples who are normally in problems, is you need to take the D word off the table. You need to take the D word off the table. Don't use it. Act like it's a cuss word. Act like it's the worst thing in the world. Act like it's a knife dividing you. Don't say it. No matter what goes on, do not say the word divorce. Because too often we in the church are treating marriages like contracts instead of covenants. If you don't render the services that I'm requiring, if you're not meeting my expectations, if you're not doing what I ask you to do, then guess what? I'm going to divorce you and move on. And what you're saying is, you're being manipulative and controlling by using that word because unless you do what I'm telling you to do, I'm moving on. We're not committed anymore today. That's a contract. But God designed it to be a covenant. So we need to take that word off the table. And then we say God's holy ordinance. Why? Because God sets the example of covenant. And I just want to show you the example that God sets. If you look at Genesis 15, it's a wonderful example of God's covenant. You see, because it says, Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. So Abram believed God. He also said to him, I, the Lord, who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know? that I will gain possession of it. So what Abram's saying is, how can I know this is true? This promise that you're telling me, how can I know that it's real? So the Lord said to him, bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. So bring me a little farm community and put it beside me, and I'm going to show you these promises. And so what happens is Abram brings the goat 
the lamb, the heifer, the pigeons, and he cuts them in two. He divides them in half. Because when someone would enter into a covenant in the Old Testament, what they would do is they would take an animal, they would sacrifice it, they would spread out the two halves, which I know is kind of disgusting to think about, and then both parties would walk through these carcasses in order to symbolize, if I break my promise, if I break my covenant, I'm as good as dead as they are. You can spill my blood just as the blood of these animals have been spilled. So they're entering into this promise together saying that it is promise unto death. And so you didn't want to break your covenant. You don't want to break your word. You didn't want to break your promise back then. Well, here's the thing that God does with Abram, which is so amazing, this example he gives. He tells Abram, divide these, carcass, divide these animals and spread out the carcasses and the blood spill all on the ground. And then what he does is he put Abram into a deep sleep off in the corner. And then God comes down in the form of a, a smoking pot and enters through these carcasses by himself. And what he is saying is, Abram, I know you're going to break your covenant. I know you're going to break your promise. But if you break your promise, I die. And if I break my promise, I die. And that's a foreshadowing of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And if you don't know who Jesus is, I don't know if you know who Jesus is or what he did. But the Bible tells us that Jesus was the son of God. Jesus was God in the flesh who came down to this earth, who humbled himself, who taught and preached and healed his people that came in contact with him. And he did not deserve to die because he was God in the flesh. He was holy and righteous and perfect. But people put him on the cross. They beat him. They hung him. And they killed him. And his blood was spilt. Not because he deserved it. But it was spilt because he wanted to shed his blood and die in order for us. He died for our sins, and because he died for our sins, even though he did not deserve it, the Bible says that he was sent to hell, and the same punishment each of us would have received. But after three days, God raised him from the dead, and the same gift and opportunity is given to each one of us. God raises us from the dead if we believe that Jesus Christ paid the price on the cross for our sins. All we have to do is have faith that Jesus paid that price. And so Christians for centuries celebrate the death and resurrection in two ways. The first is through communion. They eat the bread remembering the body. They drink the wine or the juice remembering the blood as a remembrance that Jesus' body was beaten, hung, and stabbed. And his blood was spilt and he died for our sins. The second one that we establish is the sacrament of baptism. Where a new believer is lowered into the water. Symbolizing that Jesus was lowered into the grave and spent three days in hell. And then that person who's being baptized is lowered into the water and they're raised back up again. Symbolizing to us that we are raised from the dead as well if you believe in Jesus Christ. The water washes you clean, showing that you are dead to yourself. You are dead in your sin, but you've been given new life, and now you are made clean. And then Jesus gives us this wonderful promise of a gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice that we don't have to do anything to receive this. We have a giving and covenantal God who gives us a free gift of the Holy Spirit, which says the Holy Spirit will come inside of you and will dwell in you. He will be inside of you. God's given us the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is a constant reminder that we've received his covenant of grace. God is now living in us. He's joined himself to us. We cannot separate ourselves from God, nor do believers want to. And so look at this, this covenant that God establishes between a man and a woman. He says, to become one flesh. They are to become one flesh. You cannot separate them. They are joined together. Just as God is joined with his church, just as God is joined with his people, just as God is joined 
with the believers. You cannot separate the Holy Spirit from a believer. So is the same with the marriage covenant. God is setting an example of his marriage to the church. He is the groom and the church is the bride. Believers are the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. Jesus Christ is the groom and you cannot separate the two. So why do we even try all the time? And so God established this covenant of becoming one flesh. And so it says in Genesis 2.25, Adam and Eve were both naked and they felt no shame. What does that mean? They were having sex. Everyone say, sex is good. Sex is good. I thought I'd get some amens on that one. Sex is good. It's true. God gave us the gift of sex. Sex is designed to be good. But here's what we don't often realize. Sex is meant to be the glue that holds us together. And it says, and they became one flesh. Did you realize that sex is an emotional and spiritual superglue? That's what sex is. It's an emotional and spiritual superglue. It deeply binds, bonds people to each other, whether they are aware of it or not. In fact, your brain has neurotransmitters. And in the thing of sex, the act of sex, what happens is we release certain chemicals that those neurotransmitters uh, take to our brain, stimulating it, telling us to release this chemical called oxytocin. Now, I want to read to you a little bit about oxytocin. Oxytocin has been dubbed the cuddle hormone or love hormone because it does simply that. It creates bonds, trust, and generosity in us. In fact, whenever you feel comfort or security, oxytocin is involved. It is involved in every form of human bonding. Whenever a person is sexually involved with another person, neurochemical changes occur in both their brains that bonding is the reason casual sex does not work because the mind cannot accept casual sex. It releases this bonding agent. And so sex is an enhancing and emotional bond between them whether, whether they want it or not to be. When a mother is in labor with her child, the body releases oxytocin. When a baby breastfeeds with a mother, it releases oxytocin. Why? Because God created this chemical in order to create a, a, a bonding agent such as superglue that combines these relationships together between a mother and a child. It's the same thing that happens when people have sex with one another. They're chemically rewiring the brain to bond with one another. So it's impossible to bond to something or just have casual sex without bonding to something. In fact, in this movie, the truth is, Amy didn't, wasn't just having one relationship. Amy, the problem with Amy is not that she did not want a husband. The problem with Amy is that she had multiple husbands. Every time she had a relationship and sexual intercourse, she was bonding herself to somebody else. One web MD study claims that those who wait until marriage to have sex are 50% less likely to get divorced than those who engage in premarital sex. You see, Satan is train wrecking our marriages with false information. Satan is train wrecking our marriages. Everybody say animals and angels. Culture's view on sex is to be like animals. Culture's view on sex, society's view on sex is to be like animals. Think about it. Genesis 2.20 says, So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals, but for Adam no suitable helper was found. You see, culture tells us that just lose yourself. Go out and have fun. Think about the different terms we use. When we go out, every single person um, who goes out on a weekend down to the club, every single person that goes to a vacation spot, every single person that once a year gathers together for spring break and we say, hey, when you go to that city, what happens in that city stays in that city, right? We have those terms. When we go out, we use the terms party animal. We talk about losing ourselves. We use all of these different terms that show that we're animalistic. Andy breeds dogs. Now, 
when you have two dogs in heat or the female in heat, you don't have to do much besides just put them together. Their natural biology takes place. Their natural instinct. You don't have the female dog as she's walking back and forth in front of the male dog thinking, you know what? He hasn't given me his water bowl this morning. You don't have her wonder. I wonder if he cares more about my body than me. You don't have this, this dog processing. Well, you know what? He, he just hasn't taken care of me lately and shown me enough affection. No, you put them together and biology takes place. They instantly meet. It's pure instinct. There's no higher plane, no greater cause, no transcendent person, purpose. And so the question is, when people act this way, we're so out of control. And we wake up with these regrets. The next morning, I couldn't. The question that we ask, are we the sum of our urges? Is that all we are, the sum of our biological urges? Culture will tell us to act like animals, to lose yourself. But when God brought Adam, Eve, and Eve wasn't there before what happened, he couldn't find, as he looked at any of the animals, a greater partner. And so God creates for him Eve, very specifically for him. The second thing is that people will often act like angels, animals and angels. You see, what happens is the church tells us to act like angels. The church tells us to act like angels. And so Matthew twenty two thirty says, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are, but are the angels of God in heaven. And so in Matthew we learn that angels are spirit beings that are not given to each other in marriage. They're not given because they don't have bodies. They're spirit beings. They don't have sex in heaven. And so that's what Jesus is actually instructing them that, hey, you guys are you're thinking too much like angels and what we do in the church is we try to be quiet about this topic. And what happens is we allow the world to define what sex is and what sex is not. You see, the church often gets mad if they see something like a movie train wreck. That's why I really wrestled with her to show it or not, because I knew sometimes I get complaints. Well, there's too much nudity in there. Well, yeah, your kids are seeing it at home and the commercials. Well... They use the word sex, and my kid doesn't know what sex is. Well, that's unfortunate because the truth is we should be teaching our kids about sex. They should be hearing it from us as parents, but it's an uncomfortable topic. I admit that. It is uncomfortable to talk about. It's uncomfortable to talk about in the church. My daughter, Caitlin, is going through puberty right now. I don't know what to do. I keep telling her, Mom, you got to go talk, have a conversation with her because she, something's going to happen one day and she's going to freak out. She's going to think she's dying. You got to talk to her. She's like, I will, I will, I will. If you don't do it, I'm going to do it. You got to have a talk with her. I will, I will, I will. It's an uncomfortable conversation. See, I learned about sex from my older brother in first grade. I was first grade already. You see, we want to delay that conversation forever, but the truth is the kids are learning about schools. The truth is kids are doing it in schools. They're doing stuff in the back of the bus because they're curious and they want to know and they're experimenting. And it's because we're silent on this issue. We act like we have no urges or desires at all in the church. And so we act like angels. And God didn't design us to be animalistic and he didn't design us to be angels. He tells us to be humans. God tells us to be humans. God's view on sex is to be like humans. It says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And so the truth is, if we're not having these conversations with our kids, we're making them think that it's gross, it's ugly, it's sick. And that's the message we're teaching them that, hey, you know what? We're not going to talk about sex because it's not relevant, and we don't want you to think about it, and we don't want you to experiment it, so we're not going to talk about it at all. And so it's this gross, ugly thing so now save it for your partner in marriage right that's what we teach our kids sex is gross ugly save it for the one you love I mean think about that they should be hearing it from us so there's two extremes denying our sexuality or being driven by it and then there's this vast space in between where we're to be like humans and so humans were created in the image of God 
In Genesis 127 it says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And so the truth is, if people are talking about people, you know, like the, the locker room conversation, when guys start to see a girl walk by and they begin to rate her anatomy and her body parts and, and they minimize her down to just a number. What it does is it's distorting the image of God within us. Every single person was created with the image of God within them. We are to elevate people. We are to elevate sexuality. And we're to care about it enough to care about the person within them. We're created to be humans, not animals, not angels, but humans. Bearers of the divine image. Bearers of the divine spark. It does something to that person. It hurts. It's degrading when we just degrade them down to a number. It demoralizes them. It robs them of their divine identity. And so we have so many issues around this sexuality. Jesus actually talks about this when he says we need to actually gouge out our eyes if we're lusting. We need to cut off some body parts. What does cutting off body parts, gouging out eyes, and being sent into hell have anything to do with sex? And Jesus says it's that important to get control of this. You're not animals. You're not angels. You're humans designed for a purpose. So when teenagers are looking at pornography, they're rewiring their brain to actually release oxytocin and get addicted to that pornography people are looking at magazines girls are engaging in showing off of their body and all of these things around sex because their body becomes more important and they don't realize who they are in christ their identity is in christ and the last thing because we got to go this morning i could talk all day about this because it's such an important topic i want to address the something we're missing because there's something for not just marrieds, but singles. What God is calling us to is for both of us, married or singles. Look at what 1 Corinthians 7.7 7 says. I wish that all of you were as I am. But each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift. Another has that. See, the one who's writing this is Paul to the New Testament church in Corinth. And they have all these questions about sexuality if you read 1 Corinthians 7. Whether someone should divorce, get remarried, whether it's okay to have sex. And he's hearing all these different reports about people actually having incest with one another and bragging about it in the church. And Paul addresses all these issues. I want to preach a, a series on 1 Corinthians sometime in the near future. Because it's, it's the culture we're living in today. I believe it. It's the culture we have today. And what Paul actually says, he says... It is not good, starting out, it is not good for a man to be with a woman. Now, I did this whole thing on God's design for sex to show you that if you read that out of context, what you can think is that Paul was against sex. He's really not. What he's saying is, what he's saying is that, listen, if you can't control yourself because of these animalistic urges, then go ahead and get married. Go ahead. It's okay because they're saying, should we get married or should we not get married? Should we stay single? Should we not? We've had that question throughout the ages. Should priests get married? Should pastors get married? Should they be single? Is it okay to be single? What if I don't want to get married because my parents are pressuring me to get married? What if I want to be single and my parents keep saying, when are you going to get married? When are you going to do this? When are you going to have a family? When are you going to have kids? And I get all these pressures from everyone around. Is it okay? And what Paul says is, listen, you got all these questions about singleness. You got all these questions about marriage. And what he says is, I wish that all of you were as I am. Well, it's believed that Paul was once married. He was once married. His wife probably died. Because in order to have his Jewish position that he had, he had to have been married. But now, as he's traveling around church planning, we know that he's single. Because we don't ever hear about his wife. And so Paul knows what it is to be married, and he knows what it is to be single. He knows what it is to be together, and he knows what it is to be alone. He says, I wish all of you were as I am. But each of you has your own gift from God. What he's saying is marriage is a gift given from God. Singleness is a gift given by God. He says each of you has your own gift. One has this gift and another has that. He says both are a gift. Both are okay. To live in singleness is a gift. And what he's saying is the reason it's a gift is because 
Sometimes you can focus on things and not be distracted by other things. It's a gift for me to be able to go around and plant churches and not be distracted by a wife or kids or all these other things because I can now focus on God. That's my purpose. I can live into my purpose. So singleness is a gift. He tells everybody else, marriage can be a gift. If that's your gift, raise your children, love your spouse. If that's your gift, live into your gift. Each one is a gift. And the word that he uses is charisma, this gift from God, because what charisma means, gift of grace. And so what Paul is saying is, if you're married, you need God's grace. If you're single, you need God's grace in that. You need this, this, this grace in order to stay committed to this person. Because sometimes when you're married, you're like, that's not the person that I, I wanted to be with. That's not the person I ordered. Things have changed. And, and you know what? We need God's grace in order to have these loving, lasting relationships. To be single when you're alone and you don't have anybody to share some things with and you're feeling very, very lonely. You need God's grace. And so the third thing and the last thing is we all need God's grace in order to live out our purpose. That's what it means. We need God's grace. Does anybody need God's grace this morning to live stronger relationships and marriages? Does anybody need God's grace this morning to live holy in your singleness? Does anybody need God's grace this morning? Because what I love about 1 Corinthians isn't that Paul is judging you. Don't think that because Paul, the Corinth church was running rampant. Paul wasn't judging the people. What he's saying is, I've heard some of these reports and I don't want you to continue living, hurting, destructive, train wrecked relationship one after another. And so I want to teach you about God's grace in your singleness. I want to teach you about God's grace in your marriage. Each one has a purpose. And so at this time in your life, it might be singleness, but you need God's grace to go through it. In this point of your life, it might need marriage and you need God's grace to go through it. But each one of us needs God's grace to live out our purpose that we are designed for. Amen. Let's close this morning in a word of prayer. Father God, we come before you learning on this whole topic of, of marriage and your design for it. And Father, I just want to pray specifically this morning for people, and I don't know who in this congregation, but I know we have people who probably have been divorced, and it hurts. We have people who have probably given themselves away to somebody and bonded themselves to somebody, and then that relationship didn't work out. And it's just like a divorce and it hurts. We have people here who need to reset their ideas on what it means to live a God-honoring way. And, and sometimes we've, we've sinned against you. We've walked against, away from you. And we've hurt ourselves. Even me, Lord. I remember having my child at 16 years old being a teenager and entering into sex and bonding myself to somebody else and, and hurting and even destructing a little bit of the relationship that I have with my wife in that. But Father, I know firsthand that you can bring healing to all situations. I know you can restore all things. And I know that you can heal us from our sin. You forgive our sin already, but you want to heal us from our past. You want to restore us. You want us to live differently. You're calling us not to train wreck our lives anymore. You're calling us to receive your grace, your forgiveness, and to live into that because you want the best thing for us. And so this morning, Lord, if anybody needs your grace, if they need to reset their minds from the images that they've seen online, or maybe reset their minds from the lust that they've experienced in their hearts, or maybe they need to correct some patterns in their past or even today. We come before you as we hear your holy word, repenting, Lord, asking for forgiveness. You want us to live in relationship with you. That's why you give us this grace. You give us that something. You show us that we're not alone. You show us that you're always there. You show us that we can be fully in relationship whether we're single and we're involved with friends and family and in the church or if we're married and you want us to have that grace and be an example to everybody else. You give each one of us purpose. So Father God, we just ask for your blessing and your Holy Spirit to reset those who need to be reset. 
If you need God's grace this morning, lift up your hand. Lift up your hand. Lift up your hand. If you need God's grace this morning, and I just want to pray for you. Father God, forgive us. We need you. We accept your grace. We accept your son. We accept your Holy Spirit. We invite your Holy Spirit into this place to live on us, to help us with the temptations, to help us in the struggles, to help us in the hard times. Give us your grace. Give us your relationship with you. Reset our hearts. Reset our minds. Reset our lives. And help us to live in the purpose that you've given each one of us to show the world what it means to be a follower of you. And we pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.